time to be able to worship God. Glad that you have uh, put forth the effort to be back tonight as we uh, serve our God together. Um, I want to, uh, as Keith said, we have a lengthy sick list, a lot of uh, sick folks, some of them uh, pretty critical, and we would ask you to be sure and pray for all of them. If you can, send a card to them, let them know we're thinking about them and praying for them. I know some of you are real good about sending cards, even if you don't go over to uh, group one tonight. Uh, maybe you could do that from home. That's a real good ministry. A lot of people say that uh, I went up, uh, Drew and I went up the other day to see uh, uh, to see uh, uh, someone, and I can't remember her, Shirley Tays, and she was talking about how many cards that she had received from this congregation, and that's commendable. She said that meant a lot to her. Book of Proverbs, we're going to look at chapter 3. We're going to talk about graduates tonight. And then we're going to shift from here. We're going to go over to the fellowship hall. It's been decorated and we've got refreshments over there. And we're going to honor our graduates over there uh, this evening. Glad that you have chosen to be here. There are three different divisions in Proverbs chapter 3. Number one, from verses 1 through 10, you have God's call to complete obedience. That's what you have in verses 1 through 10. Then from verses 11 through 20, you have the, the happiness and uh, uh, the contentment and the blessings of those who are walking with God. Then from there to the remainder of the chapter, verse 21 through 35, you have the confidence and you have the security of those uh, that live for God every day. When we think about a successful graduate, I have been given an opportunity. I can remember back even before I moved here, I believe it was 90, 94, 5, 6, that I had the opportunity, and I've done that a few times, to speak at Red Boiling's baccalaureate service. And I would emphasize uh, that you are graduating, but that's not the end of education. You see, you graduating perhaps from high school or college, but if you think that's the end of your schooling and you're educating yourself, uh, then you don't have the right understanding of what life is all about. And that's what you find in Proverbs chapter 3, how to be a successful graduate. Now, let's first of all look at verses 1 and 2 in the text. It says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace they will add unto you. You see, my friends, we need to realize uh, that there are people that really care. God cares. Your family cares about you. And you need to understand that God has your best interest. There are restrictions, there are uh, guidelines. Uh, we, some folks, look at the Bible as a bunch of don'ts and don't do this, don't do that. But in reality... There are both do's and don'ts in the Bible, and it is for our best interest. Lessons come, in essence, from right living. And that's what you have in verses 1 and 2. Notice he says, don't forget my law. God says through uh, Solomon, don't ever forget me. Don't forget my instructions. Don't forget my teaching. And the length of days in long life will be added unto you. And peace. You know how you can live long on this earth? Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 says this too. That you obey your parents. That it may be long with you. That you may live long on this earth. Now that doesn't. that's not a blanket statement that everybody that obeys your parents, everybody that obeys God, that you're going to live to be 106. But what it does mean, there is a principle there. You obey God and you obey good instructions and then you realize that God really cares and He's got, and your family's got your best interest. Not only that, notice in verses 3 and 4, a good name is priceless. A good name. Look at what he says in verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Put it like a, a, a necklace. Write them on the table, tablet of your heart and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Christian character is what he's talking about. And this Christian character blesses and uh, this beautifies 
uh, human nature. Friends, when you choose a good name, I can remember my granddaddy one time. I've told you this story about somebody cheated him and, and he had taken them a load of coal and the guy said, you didn't give me a whole load. And so my granddaddy said, you just keep that. You just keep that. I don't want any money from you. And on the way back, we were in that old truck that he had and somebody else was driving. I said, granddaddy, I said, all that work we did and we didn't get a penny out of that. And I can remember my granddaddy said, yes, but your name is worth more than money. Young people always remember that. Your name is worth more than silver and gold. It's important that you understand that character is something that it takes a lifetime to build your character, your reputation. It takes a lifetime to do that. Then we'll look in just a moment what it takes just very few minutes to do. You can destroy that character. So remember, a good name is priceless. You can't buy a good name. You can't buy influence. You can't buy respect. You have to earn it. And you earn it by choosing to live the right kind of life. That's what I would say to our graduates. And by the way, most of this would apply to any and all of us. That's what God would have us all to do. Choose to have a good name. Now, I'm not talking about uh, you know, a good name as far as uh, an easy name to pronounce. I'm not talking about a name that's just, you know, well, that's my parents' name. I'm, going, I'm talking about your character. I'm talking about who you are when nobody else is around. I'm talking about your influence when nobody knows, but you do, and God knows. Choose a good name. Not only that, verses 5 and 6, I have put here in going through this chapter, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding and in all of your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your steps. You know, friends, I put it down like this. If you look up, you can walk straight ahead. Look up. Because our strength comes from above, from God. Now, I, I found these four sentences, and well, actually I found three and I put another one here. You can't get lost on a straight road. Now, that's real complicated. Some of you are looking at mm -hmm. You can't get lost on a straight road. Number two, you'll never go wrong in life but doing what God's, uh, what is right with God and God's Word. You'll never do wrong. So read God's Word. If you know the instruction of God and you always look up to God, trust not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge Him, and you do that by depending upon God and upon His Holy Word to lead you and to guide you in this life, you can walk straight. Notice this. Number three, only God can see the end of the road from the beginning. So always let Him be your guide. Sometimes we wonder why things happen like they do. Maybe you didn't get the promotion you thought you ought to God. Maybe uh, there was something happened in your life and you wonder and you almost questioned God. Why did that happen? But see, God has the ability to see not only here, but He can see down the road. And God knows what is best for us. I I've seen it happen in my life. I wonder why something didn't happen like I wanted it to happen. And then I realized later on, if it had happened the way I wanted it to happen, it wouldn't have been best. So sometimes when you're pursuing a job, and you don't understand why you didn't get the job, maybe that job would have taken you away from the Lord. Maybe that job would have taken you away from the Lord uh, and the service of the Lord and being obedient to God. So you didn't get that job. We don't know, but God knows. And number four, we can't even trust our own judgment when you're young, and you can't trust it all the time. And listen to this, we can't even trust our own judgment all the time, but we can always trust God. You know why? Because God's always right. Sometimes, you know, we're human folks, and we think we're making the decision based on, well, I think I've got that figured out. I think I know what's best for me. I know what I can do. 
And I may be not getting all the advice that I need from good, wholesome people. And instead of looking at God and asking God for wisdom, like James says in James 1.5, we make the decision based on our own experiences, our own knowledge, and our own ability. And sometimes that's going to cause us to look down instead of looking up. And that's what you find in verses 5 and 6. Verses 7 and 8, sin will ruin you physically. Look at 7 and 8. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. 7 and 8, he says, do not be wise. What do you mean, do not be wise in your own sight? Well, Proverbs 28, 26, He that trusteth, trusteth in his own heart is a fool. So what do you have? Don't trust in your own decisions on what is morally right and wrong. Sin can ruin you physically, I promise you that. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Smoking may make you look cool. Smoking dope. Using drugs. You may be real cool. And you may think you fit in with the group and getting drunk on Saturday night. And you may think that's real cool and nobody knows it yet and you've been able to get by with it. But I'm here to tell you, friends, it can destroy you physically, your lungs, and could even cause wrinkles. Some of us got wrinkles and haven't done all that. You sure don't want to add to it. Sin can ruin you. It ruined, in a lot of ways, that prodigal boy, that prodigal son. I mean, he got into a far country. He got involved in a lot of sin. But thank God that he finally came to himself. Luke 15, 17 and 18, he said, I'm going to go back home. Number two, a moment's sinful pleasure can bring moments of severe pain. Remember that. I said it takes a lifetime to build character and build influence. You know, you, you, you're trying to get this thing fixed in your life and you want to live like you ought to live. You want to please God. You want people to look at you and you're going to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, Matthew 5, 13 and 16. You're going to make a difference in the lives of other people. But you know, sometimes just one moment's a sinful pleasure can cause you problems for years to come. Maybe you decide that you're going to get drunk one night. You want to try it. You have a car wreck. And you kill someone else. Or you hurt yourself. Or perhaps you're out with the guys and nobody else knows it. Just those guys there and they're your friends. and It's time to have a little fun, you know? It's time to get out of get out of mom and dad's shelter and start living a little bit on my own. And what you think you're going to do, you're going to do some things or you're tempted to do some things that are sinful, that are wrong, because you want the pleasure out of it. And I'm telling you right now, it can ruin you physically. Number three, you need to remember that our bodies, according to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, our bodies is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we ought to treat our bodies with respect. We don't want to harm our bodies. We don't want to hurt our bodies. Why? Because God is dwelling in our bodies. Jesus is dwelling in our bodies. Galatians 2 verse 20. The Holy Spirit's dwelling in our body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. So therefore, we should be careful that we don't ruin our bodies. Young people, if you start right now treating your bodies in an honorable way, in a respectful way, doing what God wants you to do and the way you ought to act and what you ought to do when nobody else is around, you will never regret that. Never. Number four, don't run up a bill when you're young that your body cannot pay when you're older. That's good advice for all of us. How many people are head over heels in debt? How many of us have got credit cards and we've got them maxed out and then we order another credit card and we max that out? I talked about that over in our marriage uh, parenting classes over there, how that we need to be able to control that. I like the Dave Ramsey plan. I don't always uh, go by it, but I like it. And that is pay when you go, while you go. The only thing that we should really be in debt for maybe is our house. And what happens sometimes, we spend and we've got to have a bigger boat 
and we've got to have a, 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 a motorcycle, and we've got to have this, and we want our children to have that, and the best of this, and the best of that. And we get so, so in debt that we spend a lifetime trying to pay that debt off. I'm going to tell you, sin will ruin you physically. Not only that, verses 9 and 10, look at the text. The text says, Honor the Lord uh, with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. You know what he's talking about? Prospering. Did you know that there is a principle found in the Bible? Now, I'm not talking about some of these guys, televangelists on TV, that if you'll send us $100, I'll send you a prayer cloth. I'll send you one cheaper than that. But for $100, you get a prayer cloth. You know what that prayer cloth will do? It will help you prosper. Boy, you will grow. And you know God's going to give you... Ble- That's nothing more than a false gospel of sincerity or of prosperity. You know what God does say, though? You serve me, and I'll prosper you. There is a principle found in the book of Proverbs and throughout the Bible that God's people are not to be lazy people. You see, it's what we give, not what we keep. God doesn't want us to be lazy people, slothful people. He wants us to be people that are willing to to give. And that's what he's saying there in verse number 9. You honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. What, what's that going to benefit you? Your barns will be filled with plenty. God's going to prosper you. more you give to God, more He's going to give back. I believe it's Luke 6.38 says about basically the same thing. So, number one, the only sure way to financially be successful is to spend less than you make. Some people, it wouldn't matter if they made 200000 a year, 300000 a year, 400000 They'd be broke by the end of the month or the end of the year. It's not how much you make. It's how you manage what you do make. And I'm telling you, this is a problem in America today. Number two, we have to learn how to master our money or our money will master us. And from the very beginning, we always are supposed to give God first. You don't give God your leftovers. You give God first, even as a teenager. If you've got a job, and when you come as a Christian, you want to give God first of what you have, what you have earned. God is the one that enabled you to be able to work and to be able to prosper and to have the health to do what you did. So, young people and every person, we need to learn today. It's not what we give. that is as important, but it's not what we keep. It's what we give to God with a good heart, with a loving heart. You know what Jesus said about that? Jesus said, What shall it profit a man if he shall give the whole world and lose his own soul? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 24. So it's not what we're able to put in the bank that's important. It's what we give. We're laying up treasures in heaven. That is important. Not only that, look at verses 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the Lord. Uh, Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest His correction. For whom the Lord loves, for whom the Lord loves, He corrects. Just as a father, the son in whom He delights. As a father, the son in whom He delights. I, I like that statement. The test of what I call correction. Don't kick correct. When somebody tries to correct you, don't get mad about it because those that are correcting you, usually a family member or a church member, they have your best interest. Maybe they're a little bit older and they've already been through that and they can see what is at the end of the tunnel here. They know what it's going to do if you keep going down that road. And so they're trying to discourage you from making that same mistake. So that's what I said here. Our mistakes can be The best thing that ever happened to us if we're willing to learn. You know, some people never learn from their mistakes. You ever just made a big blunder and man, you thought, I really goofed that. And you're going to goof. We're all going to goof. We're going to make mistakes. None of us perfect. But listen to me. Young and old, we need to learn from our mistakes. Profit from them. Be a stronger person. Let it develop your character. 
Because, hey, I, I made a mistake, I acknowledge it. Some folks will never acknowledge a mistake they've ever made in their life. If you talk to them, they're always pointing the fingers at everyone else. And you know, it's their fault, his fault, her fault. But listen to me, friends. We all make mistakes. We need to t- uh, take, uh, own up to it, acknowledge it, and uh, learn from it and become a better person. Not only that, I read this one day and I thought it was good. I saved it in my notes. No one is so intelligent that he will never need to say, I don't know. No one is so big that he will never need to say, I'm sorry. No one is perfect that he will never uh, need to say, I was wrong. Don't ever think you're so big that you're so smart that you don't have to admit that you're wrong. That's the test of correction. You know when you think about Graduate, graduation. I said that graduation is, you know, that's, a, that's an honorable thing. It, it's something that we ought to be proud of. You know, some of you have been going to school for a long time, and you think, man, this is it. And that part of your schooling, that part of your education, it's over. You know, life is an education. You learn. You grow. You develop. Do, do you learn something about every day? I do. Sometimes it's not real good stuff what I learn about stuff. But, you know, sometimes you you learn things, don't you? Life is a learning process. And what do you want to do? Here here you are, but you want to be here. And what's going to get you to where you need to be when you want to be like Jesus? Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you that's in Christ Jesus. Remember we talked about in our Bible class this morning, if you've been risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Well, how, how do we get from here to here? Not just because we graduate from high school or college, and that's, that's pretty well, that's the end of it. No, 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 no. That's just, that part of our life is completed. And now we're continuing this journey. And we're going to learn from our mistakes. There's going to be correction. There's going to have to be some acknowledgement. There's going to have to be the control of money. There's going to have to be control of friends. There's, I know... That many, sometimes, young people think that we old people are just a bunch of fogies and we don't know a whole lot. I used to think that too about my mom and daddy. I remember when I was 14 years old, I got so mad at my mom and daddy one time, they wouldn't let me do something. I was going to run away from home. We had a barn in behind the house there. And uh, I ran out of that house. It was about 5 o'clock. And I got in behind that barn and I was going to watch them. I said, they're going to come looking for me. 5.30, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 7.30, and it's beginning to get dark. You know, that was the hardest thing I ever had to do. I had to go back home. Daddy said, I thought you was running off. I said, you wouldn't care if I did, would you? He said, son, you got a lot to learn in life. You know, life is a learning process. Young people just don't ever stop where you are. Grow, learn, develop, mature. And first and foremost, always give God your life. Because you don't know when you're going to be in a car, or you don't know when you're going to be hunting, or you don't know when you're going to be fishing, or you don't know when you go around a curve one day and there's a drunk driver hits you head on and that is the end of you. You don't know when that's going to happen. So always put God first and learn and grow from your mistakes and develop your character. It's a life process. You'll never regret it. If you're not a Christian tonight, we encourage you to become one. Perhaps you're not a Christian and you've been thinking about this. We would love to be able to assist you. Maybe you've got some Bible questions. We'd be glad to open the Bible up and answer those from the Scripture. If you need to become a child of God, the Bible teaches us that faith cometh by hearing, and by hearing the Word of God. You must believe that Gospel, John 8, 24, and you must repent of your sins. Repentance means a change of life, a change of action, a change of direction. Repentance, godly sorrow, produceth uh, repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse number 10. And then you need to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and we can baptize you into Jesus to allow the blood of Jesus to wash away all of your sins, just like Acts 22 says, and a host of other passages. If you need to come back home tonight, maybe you've been struggling with some of these things. 
And nobody knows it, but uh, you know it, and you feel like you just you you need the prayers of of God's people in order to restore you to a relationship that you ought to be in. Or maybe some do know it, and uh, it's out in the community. Maybe you need to repent. I know you need to repent of that. You need to acknowledge it. Would you come right now while together we stand as we sing?